Cool uh, diagram showing you what can happen if you take this one wild plant, wild mustard, and we see this all over uh, Southern California. You can see this growing on the hills. It's quite uh, prevalent all over here. I'm pretty sure it's um, not native. I think it was brought over from Europe when the Spaniards first came here, but we're going to have to um, look that up. But you see, you can take this one original plant and turn it into all these other different plants. Um, broccoli, which you've all <laughs> eaten before, focusing on the flowers and the stems, um, selecting those plants with especially big uh, flowers and stems. And we got cauliflower, focusing on the clusters. And I mean, cauliflower, you do have to tie it up a certain way. Um, very similar cauliflower is cabbage, um, where you're looking at what's called the terminal bud. And then probably one of my least favorite out of all these Brussels sprouts, you got little buds coming off the stem. So yeah, any kind of mutant that would have a lot of buds coming off the stalk coming up, they would breed those together to get those delicious Brussels, Brussels sprouts. And then focusing on the leaves themselves, you have kale. And then, uh, let me look at my copy there, uh, kohlrabi. So yeah, kohlrabi, um, which we don't really look at too much, but focusing on the stem. So just like we see, you know, dogs, other animals, when we domesticate it, we can get all these amazing um, plants uh, or varieties, all from a single original one. And this is, you know, with humans acting over decades, um, which isn't a long time. Think about the earth and how old it is. Um, so how do you think wild rice was developed? So certain individuals um, selected based on their physical properties. And these are the physical properties that uh, they wanted to get at. So basically a large kernel. Okay, and then you just keep breeding it, breeding it and over time you get your different varieties. So different breeds of dogs. If you wanted a dog with short hair, breed short hair dogs together and you can go even beyond hair color but um, things like aggression if you want aggressive dogs you're going to want to take the dogs you find to be most aggressive and breed them together as well breed Breed those aggressive dogs together. And basically, um, whatever you're doing it, keep uh, breeding like with like. So don't allow other um, types of characteristics to come into that bloodline. Keep breeding like with like. And surprising sometimes it's over two, three, four generations, um, which for dogs can be 10 years and get all these new varieties, new breeds. This is interesting. So we all know all modern dogs came from the um, gray wolf. You can actually back breed any of these dogs with the wolf and get wolf hybrids. Um, but some of these you might remember, I don't know all of them, um, but this is the husky right there. This is the Malamute. Um, this right here, oh, this India Saluki is what it's called. And this is the Afghan Hound. Um, oh, Akita. I, I know that one. Um, and let's see. This right here is the... Uh, Basenji. 
and we can see there's these different land races, Europe, North America, China, and India, and they've been bred and developed over time to come up with these different types of dogs that we all like. So Darwin did not write anything about dogs. Like I'm talking a lot about dogs. He talked about pigeons. Now why did he use pigeons and not dogs? Well, it's because pigeons were kind of like the dogs of the 19th century. So 19th century, most people didn't have the space and the uh, money to take care of dogs. Dogs do require, you know, having a house, and, um, not necessarily a yard, but place to walk them, walk the dog around, take a lot of food. Um, pigeons, you can have those on a rooftop and uh, they're a little easier to take care of in, uh, in 19th century England. So a lot of people would breed pigeons and you can see all these different color combinations. We don't breed pigeons now, so you haven't seen anything like this. You just know this wild pigeon. But you can get all of these different varieties if you breed them together. And people understood this. They understood, you know, they had neighbors, they themselves um, bred pigeons and they could see all the different colors, all the different varieties they were getting uh, just by controlling the breeding process. So, bam, if you can get them to look different um, by controlling the breeding, just think of nature when the, uh, the natural conditions change. You get a lot of different uh, variations and then potentially speciation. So, I like this example here. We have, looks like kind of some palm grass plant. Um, what we see here is variety, and that's another key aspect of evolution, natural selection. We always see variety. We see that in all populations. Um, even identical twins, there's variety. Um, you can tell them apart. Well, it takes me a while, but you can see in this population of, of, of grasses, uh, you have some taller individuals. Okay, so. If you take these taller individuals and breed them together, on average, like if you look, if I just draw a line, that's probably the average height. If I come over here, it looks like the average height increased a little bit, you know, by about that much from here to here. And if you keep doing that again and again and again, uh, you can gradually, you know, the next group will be taller, the next group will be a little bit taller. But you'll still see, you still get these shorter individuals. You always have that variation. So it's really averages that we're talking about here. So these images represent how you can uh, select, select for traits, and then do artificial, um, do breeding with those traits. So breed traits to change the population average, um, to change, uh, what those are I'm looking for, um, change the average for population, you know, whatever that trait might be. Uh, the word I'm looking for is frequency. I remember just in time. So. The frequency, so the frequency of those different traits, either being uh, tall or shorter, or whatever. Okay, so important concepts here, homologous structures. So basically structures that look s similar, but have separate evolutionary origins. Those are called analogous structures, and a good the best example of that you can understand would be insect wings and bird wings. Look at them. They function very on a similar fashion, but they're, they evolve separately through separate mutations. So different, so I'll put different mutations led to that. Um, kind of like, you know, humans being able to drink milk into adulthood. Uh, that evolved in Europe through one mutation and also evolved in India through a, a different mutation. It wasn't shared. So um, different mutations led to those wing, those arms, 
those appendages <laughs> that uh, eventually grew into those different structures. Um, analogous structures describes this idea called convergent. You start out here, and then you kind of converge onto an idea that works. It looks similar, looks related, but it isn't. So we can tell that through um, DNA and careful structural, anal structural analysis. So scientists knew, you know, evolutionary scientists knew about their separate origins even before DNA. Um, structures that look different, but have the same evolutionary origin are called homologous structures. Um, and that happens through divergent evolution. Um, also adaptive radiation, we saw the diagram, diagram of you know, Darwin's finches. That's a good example of divergent evolution. Darwin's finches. So Darwin, uh, he, the forearm of the human, the porpoise, which is a type of, kind of looks like a dolphin. Yeah, dolphin. Yeah, dolphin. A mole, which is like a little, you know, uh, uh, gopher thing. A horse, and those have the same bones and the same relative position. Um, and it's not really obvious at first, okay? It's only half, you really look at all the bones. Even if you eat like chicken, <laughs> in a chicken wing you can see a lot of the similar, um, similar bones, the way they come together. Not really similar because, uh, you know, chickens we evolved a long time ago, you know, differently, uh, mammals and birds. Um, but there's also these interesting things called vestigial structures. Those things we have now that don't have a, an obvious purpose, but at some point in evolutionary history, they you, um, were utilized for something. So whales have a pelvis and thigh bones, and that is very interesting for something that lives in the ocean. So the idea being, you know, we know that they evolved from land creatures. So those are just gradually um, going away, becoming less functional, but it's still there. So just think, they, they evolved to go into the water at one point. Could they eventually evolve to come back out of the water? You know, they still have all of the DNA, the genetics to put those structures together. I mean, it's obvious they have a pelvis and thigh bones. Okay. Humans, uh, we have a tailbone, which is kind of our leftover uh, tail, and appendix, which, by the way, probably has an, a function um, to hold on to useful bacteria. It really helps people who've had um, intestinal issues. Uh, and their normal gut bacteria gets wiped out. If they have some little bit of that original bacteria, they can get restarted and um, they can get become healthy again. And these are very difficult to explain without the process of evolution. Um, in particular, if you look at ID, which is intelligent design or creationism, um, if there was a creator that created everything, why would they leave in all these structures that aren't useful? Why were they created um, to, you know, potentially work in a different environment. So those two ideas have a real struggle um, explaining um, vestigial structures. So here we have different beak shapes and we can see fruit eaters, it's kind of bigger. Insect eaters, you have a little bit smaller. Crushing, you got that really deep um, base of the uh, of the beak there and you got cactus eaters um, so all these different um, all these different shapes um, shapes determined by the diet shapes of beaks
by diet. Okay, and they evolve, adapt to work with food supply. We'll say work best with available food supply. Oh, Galapagos Islands, they're about 500 miles off of the coast of South America. So the Pusa has a long ways to go, but not really for birds. Um, 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles are unusual for a lot of seasonal migrations. Birds are very adapted to conserving energy and, and coasting on uh, air currents. So that's not crazy. And some species hardly ever even touch the ground like the frigate bird and the swift. They almost never land, which is pretty phenomenal. What's really cool, there was a huge earthquake um, in 2011 in Japan that ended up uh, ruining that nuclear power plant, caused a lot of issues, and all this debris was sent off the mainland into uh, boats and other sorts of materials that floated. And Starting uh, last year that I saw an article on this, that would have been uh, 20, 2017, uh, these animals started to arrive in North America um, in containers, boats, holes, other sorts of plastic things. They've been drifting around the Pacific for what, set, uh, six years, and then arriving in North America. So it just shows you know, on, you know, before plastics and everything, there was wood debris that floated around um, the oceans. If that stuff, um, if animals got stuck on different rafts of debris, they could survive in the ocean, float around for years, and then end up in different areas and then populate those areas. So life is pretty amazing at where it will um, go to. Um, they can diverge into different species. So, say, if it's a, a population of snakes, for example, separated by mountain, river, or an ocean, um, they will not be able to breed with each other effectively. They're not going to cross that mountain, cross that ocean, river, and they'll accumulate genetic changes that they won't go. So separate this snakes over here. These snakes are over here. Nah, that's not a very good diagram. They're going to change, change, change. So eventually, maybe this one's a lot bigger. This one's smaller. Ooh, genetic changes. Say this bear goes away. Maybe they can't breed with each other anymore. Interbreed. And if that um, if that happens, then you get speciation. Okay, the development of a new species. Development of new species. So the lava lizard of the Galapagos, just take a guess at where they would have come from. So they were originally in South America, rode over the Galapagos, Galapagos. on some debris. And then um, they're isolated from their pop from their mainland uh, cousins or their population they came from, and mutations occurred either by chance or be through natural selection. The frequency of the different genes changed and they became a new species. So that separation and then that isolation year after year, uh, mutations building up leads to speciation. And if they do diverge over time, we should see some living examples of this. And uh, we, maybe they're different, but not 
to the point they're different species yet. Um, a couple of examples, red grouse of Britain and the willow ptarmigan of Norway. So let's look at these. So, what do you think? Are they the same, same or different species? Um, claim, so maybe you'll say they are different species. Um, your evidence, you have the different coloring, right? They're uh, a lot of, they're separated geographically. So they're unlikely that to breed. Oh, they could. Um, look at the beak shape, looks a little different. So that's your evidence and the reasoning of, so the coloring beak, um, separation would have led to uh, changes that are not shared. And over time we would see, um, now I don't know if they come together, they can breed. We could also go the same route that they are the same species. And um, that's your claim. Your evidence is they're very similar. Only you know color, but the the rest of the features are very similar. And your reasoning would be um, separation not long enough. <laughs> not long enough cause a change um, and therefore not lead to evolution yet.